Each year, we have a distinguished speaker who delivers a ecumenical message to us. Uh, this morning, we are so very thankful that the Bishop of Rhode Island has uh, graced us with his presence and taken time from his very busy schedule to be with us. And Bishop, I certainly, as I said earlier, want to thank you for having uh, us share in the ministry of Father Joe. He is a wonderful uh, uh, leader here on our campus, as are Reverend Devins and Reverend Saul Goodman. Because uh, the bishop and I and Katie both grew up in western Pennsylvania, I can appreciate uh, his early life through his college education at St. Francis. And I can assure all of you that in Pennsylvania, we would think nothing of this snow <laughs> in the morning. And so uh, as he got up and as I got up this morning, there was no thought of us canceling this wonderful <laughs> event. He pursued his uh, graduate studies after St. Francis College at the North American College in Rome and the Pontifical Liturgical Institute of St. Anselmo in Rome, a magnificent city and a place obviously uh, important for the religious uh, work that is done there. Bishop to Tobin was ordained a priest in 1973 and since has served with distinction and dedication at many parishes and in positions of increased responsibility within the Catholic Church. He's a man of uh, remarkable compassion, demonstrated leadership, and wonderful religious dedication. He was named the eighth Bishop of Providence by Pope John Paul II on March 21, 2005. He serves on the boards of both the Providence College and Salve Regina University, so he understands uh, full well the importance of having a spiritual presence on a college campus. He is a, a distinguished writer doing a uh, weekly column, without a doubt, which has been incorporated into a book with the same name. As we uh, begin to think about building a chapel, Bishop, we'd ask for your special thoughts and prayers that at some point we too will have a, a, a magnificent chapel on our campus. Uh, we also ask that the architects and the builders have far fewer change orders than are common. Uh, <laughs> it is now my distinct honor and privilege uh, to introduce our guest speaker, Reverend uh, Bishop of Providence, Bishop Tobin. President Makeley, Katie, thank you so much once again for your very kind and, and gracious invitation to be with you today. And thanks for your very kind and generous introduction as well. Special opportunity and privilege for me to visit your beautiful campus at Bryant University, my second time here, I believe, and I will be back a couple more times in the next six weeks or so. And thank you for the opportunity of participating in a very worthwhile and very inspiring program. It's truly a privilege for me to be part of this event that's grown so well over the years and now has such a very important place in, in our local community. So my congratulations to all who have organized our prayer breakfast and special word of thanks and congratulations to all of you for coming out this morning. The weather is a little bit more inviting than it was last week, but I know that all of you had to make some special arrangements to, to be here this morning. Um, we heard some reference to the students getting up early this morning to be here. The other possibility is that they're just coming in from last night. I, I, I don't think that's the case, but that happens sometimes. It's certainly very nice to see so many here, and particularly leaders of other religious communities and, and faith communities. Thank you all for being here. I would like to share a little reflection this morning on, on these words. Prayer begets faith, faith begets love, and love begets service on behalf of the poor. These words were written by Blessed Mother Teresa of Calcutta, and I suspect that most of you remember her and know her story, the Albanian nun who moved to India and worked in India for decades among the poorest of the poor, Mother Teresa, who won a Nobel Peace Prize for her work. Mother Teresa, who spoke at uh, one of the prayer breakfasts in Washington, D.C., that President Makeley described earlier uh, this morning. My reflections, of course, will come from a Catholic perspective. It's the only religious language I know how to speak. But in dealing with these themes of prayer and faith and love and service, 
I believe they are themes that are common to every religious tradition. So while I come from a religious a Catholic background, I hope you can apply my words to your own religious experience as well. And it all begins with prayer. It all begins with prayer. When I was a child growing up, we learned from our Catholic catechism that a prayer is a lifting up of our hearts and our minds to God. When we were taught that there are different kinds of prayer, personal prayer and public prayer, formal prayer that we use with memorized words and informal prayer as well, when we simply express our deepest aspirations to the Lord. There are different reasons for prayer. We pray, we pray in adoration of God for who He is and all that, that He does in our life. We pray for contrition, for the forgiveness of our sins, our personal sins, and the sins of our society and our world. We pray in thanksgiving to thank God for His many gifts and blessings that He bestows upon us all the time, day in and day out. And we pray in, in supplication to ask God for His gifts and His blessings in our lives, for ourselves and our families and our friends and all the needs and intentions of the world. Regardless of this, the form of prayer or the reason for prayer, one thing that is common is that prayer unites our spirit with the Spirit of God. It expands our horizons. Prayer makes us more attuned to the voice of God and the will of God in our lives. I think of the analogy of trying to tune in a radio. I don't know about you, I listen to the radio, especially when I'm falling asleep at night, and especially AM radio. And sometimes when you're traveling, you know, you try to tune in the radio, you're trying to get a distant station, and you, you tune in to a station, and it fades in and out, and you get lots of static, and you have to tune it in just exactly right to get the station that you want to listen to and hear clearly. Prayer helps us to be more attuned to God's voice in our life so that we can hear clearly without interference, without distraction, without fading in and out. Prayer makes us more attuned to God's voice. And it makes us more attuned to moral questions, to questions of right and wrong and good and evil so that we can form our conscience properly. Prayer originates in silence, but it always results in action. And that takes us to the second part of Mother Teresa's reflection. Because prayer then begets faith. Faith is a response to our God who has created us and has loved us and has been so very, very good to us. And once we recognize God's presence and providence in our lives, then we naturally respond with faith. And if our faith is authentic, it has a leading role in your life. I've often said and written that too often we think of God as a fire extinguisher. We put God in the corner of our lives. We know where He is. We don't think about Him very often, but we want Him to be there when we need Him. We've had that experience in our national history as well. You're all old enough to remember the tragic events of September 11th, five years ago. And you remember after the terrible events of that day how people flocked to their temples and synagogues and churches. At least for that weekend, or a couple weekends, as we turn to God in our need and in our sorrow and in our devastation, but then pretty quickly everything went back to normal again. And God was once again placed in the corner like a fire extinguisher so we wouldn't need him again until some personal crisis or national emergency. Some of you, not too many I suppose, but some of you are old enough to remember the Cuban Missile Crisis of 1962. Very much the same event where we are on the, on the brink of nuclear war and one misstep by the Soviet Union or the United States would result in the devastation of the world. And people flock to their churches. And at least in our Catholic tradition, people lined up at the confessionals so they'd be prepared for whatever might come. But isn't that often our experience of God? 
We use them in times of personal emergency or national crisis, and then we put them away again. God is not a fire extinguisher. St. Paul tells us that it is in God that we live and move and have our very being. So if our faith is authentic, no part of your life can remain unredeemed. If your faith is authentic, it has real consequences. And one of the consequences of faith is love. Mother Teresa says that faith begets love. Her culture often speaks of love. When I first prepared these remarks, our breakfast, of course, was planned for Valentine's Day. And I was going to talk a lot about Valentine's Day and love. But we know that love is much more than a warm, fuzzy feeling. And, and love is much more than a license to do whatever we want or think is good. Love is an act of the will that has profound consequences as well. Our current Holy Father, Pope Benedict XVI, wrote his first encyclical, Deus Caritas Est, God is Love. Whenever I mention Pope Benedict XVI, by the way, I have to tell this little episode right after he was elected Pope almost two years ago. I was at a liturgical service in one of our churches in Ohio, and the young lady who got up to lead the intercessions, lead the prayers, prayed for our new Pope, Pope Benedict the XVI. <laughs> Every time I see that written, I think of that. It's FBI, CSI, and XVI. Pope Benedict the 16th wrote his first encyclical on love, Deus Caritas Est. God is love. And that's what the Bible tells us. St. John says God is love. And what does the Bible tell us about love? Well, we heard that reflection this morning. Love is patient. Love is kind. It is not jealous. It is not pompous. It is not rude. Love does not brood over injury. It does not rejoice over wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. That's a description of love. And if God is love, what we say of love, we can say of God. God is patient. God is kind. God does not brood over injury. He does, does not rejoice over wrongdoing, but he rejoices with the truth. Love moves us beyond our inherent sense of selfishness and moves us into solidarity with others. I remember a description by one of our social commentators who, who described how popular magazines reflect the tenor of our culture and our society. And he said years ago, one of the most popular magazines was Life. And nothing is much broader than Life that incorporates almost everything. He said a few years later, another magazine came along that was very, people, very popular called People a little bit more narrow than life, but still fairly broad in its descriptions. And then a little bit after that, another magazine came along called Us, just about you and I and interpersonal relationships. And finally and inevitably, a magazine appeared called Self. So we went from life to people to us to self, reflecting the inherent selfishness of our society and our culture. Love opens our hearts to God and opens our hearts in solidarity to other people, our brothers and sisters, especially the poor and the needy. Mother Teresa said, love begets service of the poor. When Mother Teresa speaks of poverty, she speaks also of spiritual poverty. Not just material poverty, but spiritual poverty. Someone who lives without love and affirmation. And that's the first challenge, I believe, is, is to recognize the truly poor in our midst. I have a special affection. I've been a longtime fan of the folk group, Peter, Paul, and Mary, the group that started in the 60s, and they're still around. In fact, they're coming to Providence, I understand, at the end of March for a concert. And they sing about all these popular themes, but also a lot of social 
justice themes. And one of their more recent songs is called Invisible People. As they speak about the poor in our midst, they say, invisible people, we can't see their tears. They still cry out, but no one can hear invisible people. Three years ago, I had the opportunity of traveling to the Dominican Republic on behalf of Catholic Relief Services, and we visited there some very, very poor villages, bates, where Haitian immigrants come to the Dominican Republic to work as illegal immigrants to help the economy of the Dominican Republic. And we visited the shanty towns where the Haitians lived. Terrible, abject poverty. Half of the children in this one little village I visited, half of the children were infected with HIV and AIDS. Wouldn't live to become adults. Last year I had the chance to visit Egypt. There too, on behalf of Catholic Relief Services, we visited some very terribly poor villages where people were getting a few dollars a month to eke out a little living for themselves and, and their children. And then we came home to our relatively comfortable lifestyle. But you don't have to travel to distant lands to serve the poor. They are all around you, the materially poor and the spiritually poor. They live in personal poverty and material poverty and spiritual poverty. Our hearts and our minds and our souls need to be open to the invisible people right around us. We need to see their faces, hear their cries, understand their plight, walk in their shoes, share our gifts, and change their lives. Love begets service of the poor. I think it's a beautiful little reflection from Blessed Mother Teresa. Prayer begets faith, faith begets love, and love begets service on behalf of the poor. Those words describe a powerful combination of prayer and action, and how different our world would be if we had more prayer, faith, love, and service. Thank you, and God bless you.